next speaker is Dr. Ahmed Lanizi. Dr. Ahmed is a consultant in medicine and rheumatology. He had his fellowship training at Miguel University, Montreal in Canada. Currently, he's an international fellow of the American College of Rheumatology. He's also a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Canada and the member of the American College of Physicians. He's also the current president of the Kuwait Association of Rheumatology. Dr. Ahmed is going to present the clinical relevance of hyperuricemia. Please welcome Dr. Ahmed Lanizi. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, I would like to thank the organizing and the uh, scientific committee to involve me uh, to be one of the speakers. I'm going to talk about the clinical prevalence of hyperuricemia, and the topic uh, is very well selected, uh, specified to the prevalence, not to cover all the aspects of hyperuricemia, uh, and that's why I'm going to talk uh, about uh, pre pre prevalence without uh, uh, evaluating the patients with hyperuricemia, without uh, the, uh, uh, going through diagnostic and treatment approaches of hyperuricemia, because uh, this topic is really uh, a large topic, and the time will not allow me to cover all these aspects. This is the outline of my uh, talk. I'm going to talk about the, uh, briefly about the uh, purine uh, metabolism, then the definition of hyperuricemia, uh, touch base on the epidemiology, and then we're going to finish with the clinical uh, relevance of hyperuricemia, uh, talking about asymptomatic hyperuricemia, crystal deposition, and non-crystal deposition uh, associations. As you know, uh, purines are uh, uh, proteins, uh, nitrogenide proteins, uh, involved in a uh, very complex uh, biosynthesis process, uh, processes in the body within uh, an end product of uric acid. Uh, and uh, it is believed that two-thirds of the uh, uric acid produced in the body comes from these uh, uh, processes inside the body, and one-third comes of our diet. So our diet uh, plays a role just in uh, one third of the uh, uric acid level, and probably less than this. Uh, the definition of hyperuricemia is not an easy uh, topic uh, because there is no universally accepted uh, definition for such uh, level of uh, uric acid. There is the statistical definition, which is not popular and not uh, uh, clinically. Uh, practical, and there is the physic, uh, physiochemical definition based upon uh, solubility of uric acid in the body, uh, and it is uh, determined to be more than 7 milligrams per deciliters, uh, which is equivalent to 416 micromoles uh, per uh, liter. Uh, however, the hyperuricemia definition in non crystal related uh, uh, conditions is a bit problematic because of the high uh, prevalence of uric acid above the saturation uh, level within the uh, two standard deviation of normal uh, uric acid. Uh, and there is association of uric acid level uh, with cardiovascular diseases and other comorbidities uh, seen in uh, subsaturating levels. So it's not an easy uh, um, uh, definition to find uh, to cover all the aspects uh, of complications of hyperuricemia. Uh, saying that the clinically relevant definition uh, uh, that was suggested by most expert uh, uh, opinions uh, being the uric acid of more than 6 uh, milligrams per deciliters equivalent to 360 micromoles per liters. And that's based on uh, the fact that this level integrate the threshold for lifelong risk of uh, complications uh, above this level. And it is widely recommended uh, goal level for successful treatment, especially uh, in gout-related complications. However, it is uh, controversial, uh, and uh, not all the uh, health organizations related to gout uh, and crystal diseases uh, agree on this level. For example, the British uh, Society for Rheumatology, uh, uh, their level 
uh, is five, less than uh, six. And if we talk about the most recent um, uh, guidelines, the clinical guidelines, talking about uh, treatment of gout uh, and uh, trying to find what's the best level uh, to target uh, to prevent recurrent gout, uh, this was published uh, just uh, two months ago by the American College of Physicians. Uh, and when they talked about what level we should target uh, to reduce the uh, attacks of gout, uh, I, just, I will read the, the quotation here. The evidence was insufficient to conclude whether the benefits of escalating urate lowering therapy to reach serum urate target uh, uh, or treat to target. So they're saying there is no such uh, 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 universal target to try to reach, rather than try to treat your patients to the point that will prevent the gout attacks. So they did not specify uh, a target level uh, to, to, uh, to reach with your patients. What we have to do is just give them a urate lowering agents and at certain um, level, uh, the gout attacks will be prevented at least by um, less than one attack every one to two years, and that will be our target. So it is individualized uh, uh, target uh, for such patients. Now regarding the classification of persistent hyperuricemia, as you know, there is primary uh, hyperuricemia, which is in the absence of, uh, absence of coexisting diseases and drugs, and there is the secondary, uh, either because of excessive uh, production or diminished renal cleaners. And there is a huge list of causes, uh, among them the genetics, uh, some medical problems, uh, and drugs that uh, contribute to uh, both categories of causes of hyperuricemia. Hyperuricemia is extremely common. Uh, it affects around 20 to 25 percent of adult males. And it is seen less uh, frequently in women, probably because of the uh, osteogenic effect on the renal, renal uh, clearance of uh, uric, uh, uric acid. And that's why when they're above 50 and when they reach the menopause uh, period, the prevalence of hyperuricemia equalizes that of males. And that's why some uh, patients at, the, at their menopause, when they take the uh, hormonal replacement therapy, the uric acid will be reduced uh, uh, using this uh, uh, treatment. And regarding the potential clinical consequences of uh, hyperuricemia, there are three major uh, categories or clinical, clinical implications. Asymptomatic hyperuricemia, and that I will talk about that in integration with other uh, complications. The crystal deposition related, like gout, tophaceous gout, acute or chronic hyperuricemic nephropathy, uric acid nephrolithesis, and asymptomatic monosodium urate crystals deposition, which is um, uh, kind of a new category uh, being uh, talked about uh, lately in rheumatology practice. And the other associations of hyperuricemia like hypertension, chronic uh, kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, and insulin, uh, insulin resistance. Uh, in regards to uh, gout or crystal deposition related to hyperuricemia, it's only seen in less than 25% of people who are having hyperuricemia. Uh, and that means most cases are asymptomatic. So uh, that's very important fact for the primary health, uh, primary health uh, caregivers. They, they see a lot of patients coming with different joint uh, pain symptoms uh, not necessarily typical for gout, and they do uh, simple investigations including uric acid, and when they find it high, they blame it for the uric acid, which is a wrong uh, correlation. We have to uh, have the uh, right clinical background to correlate hyperuricemia with uh, the joint pain, because most of the hyperuricemic patients will be asymptomatic. And the degree of hyperuricemia is proportional to the risk of deposition-related diseases. Again, that means awareness is very important 
of how to evaluate hyperuricemia and its uh, uh, complications. This is just a, a simple um, diagram looking at stages of gout. Asymptomatic hyperuricemia uh, is the first stage, and then the acute attacks, then the intercritical period, which is the periods between the uh, acute attacks, and then chronic gout with tophaceous uh, formation. And just to look at the correlation between hyperuricemia and gout. This is a very interesting study uh, that followed more than 2,000 patients, males over 15 years with serial uh, uric acid levels. And they looked at the annual incidence of gout based on uric acid level. And it was amazing that uh, uh, for those who had more than 530 mil micromoles per liters, only 5% had gout. So uh, imagine how much we see with hyperuricemia. We blame their joint pain for gout, and it's a wrong uh, correlation. And for those less than uh, uh, 530 micromoles, the, the range uh, or the incidence was between 0.1 to 0.5% a year. And the accumulative risk was only 22%. And that's, that means uh, most patients, 78 patients of hyperuricemia will not develop gout over five years. Uh, probably they will not have any problems. Tophaceous gout, uh, it is associated with hyperuricemia and antecedent uh, gouty arthritis, which is basically the, when they have long period without having uh, uh, gout or acute gout. And for some reason that we don't know, it is seen more in patients who are having, who are taking uh, non-steroidals or steroids for other reasons. So probably the, uh, uh, the inflammation by itself uh, reduces the uh, deposition of uh, TOFI. And the risk factors that uh, for de developing uh, gout and asymptomatic hyperuricemia, probably all of us know, like alcohol, uh, meat uh, and seafood, diuretics, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, non losartan uh, ARB uh, inhibitors, hypertension, and obesity. Uh, now, for the asymptomatic mono uh, sodium urate crystals, this is uh, probably becoming more uh, popular among rheumatologists who are interested in ultrasound because we do see that and there is good uh, diagnostic criteria to detect the uh, uh, monosodium urates uh, by the ultrasound. It can be seen also in arthroscopy and in CT, but unfortunately there is lack of ev evidence to address the prediction of clinical gout, so what to do with these patients, we don't know, and the prediction of hyperuricemia associated comorbid diseases and uh, such finding. Uh, and when we talk about chronic renal failure, it is a well-known association with hyperuricemia. However, the causal role of hyperuricemia is not established yet, uh, despite the, uh, the well-known association. Uh, and in hyperuricemia uh, that's seen in uh, chronic kidney disease due to reduced uric acid excretion, it is accompanied by, unaccompanied by uh, urate acid uh, uh, excretion. Uh, that's in contrast to you, you acute uric acid nephropathy where we have uh, overproduction leads to enhanced uric acid excretion. And there is still uncertainty regarding the extent of hyperuricemia uh, in, corp uh, in contribution of chronic renal disease. We don't know how much is causing renal disease or vice versa. And this is just a simple mechanism of, uh, what's, uh, of the pathogenesis. What happens is the uric acid deposits uh, starts in the renal in interstitium, then an inflammatory reaction starts, then tubular interstitial injury, and probably renal tophi. All these reactions and processes will cause the uh, renal injury and impairment eventually. And just to look at the, this uh, study to uh, uh, just to address what level of hyperuricemia is, is probably relevant to chronic renal disease. 
uh, and in this very old study, they found that uh, levels more than 700 probably related to chronic renal disease in males, and levels more than 500 or 600 micromoles per liter probably related to chronic re renal disease in females. However, sometimes we do have uh, chronic renal disease patients with very high uric acid. We need to know, uh, is that related to the kidney disease or it's because of something else? And this study have looked at this and they found that uric acid out of proportion for the, de for the degree of renal insufficiency <coughs> sorry, was more than uh, 500 in cases where you have the creatinine uh, being less than 130. Uh, prob probably it's better to use the um, uh, filtration rates nowadays, but this is the only study that I found uh, addressing this issue. And for those uh, uh, having more than 600, uh, it is out of proportion if the creatinine level is between 130 and 70, and if they have uh, uric acid more than 700, it is out of proportion if the creatinine is more than 176. Uh, nephrolithesis or stones, uh, fortunately it's, uh, uh, it's a rare complication. Uh, it is an increased uh, urinary uric acid. Um, uh, it is a risk factor uh, when you have urinary uh, uric acid excretion rather than uh, calcium oxalate. It is seen in 50% of patients in case if they, if they have uric acid uh, excretion of more than 1,100 milligrams per day. And it is, uh, as I said, it is an uh, uncommon problem. Now, in regards to non-crystal deposition disorders, uh, like hypertension, uh, chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular complications, and insulin resistance, uh, hyperuricemia has not been uh, well uh, established uh, as a causal factor. Uh, in fact, there is some evidence supports that it has a protective role, especially for uh, degenerative and inflammatory neurogenic uh, problems through the antioxidant uh, effect of uric acid. In regards to uh, cardiovascular, there is a well-known association. Uh, however, uh, the proposed, uh, proposed mechanism, uh, probably because of worsening uh, hypertension, or development of hypertension if, in case if you have hyperuricemia uh, and because of the oxidative uh, stress. However, it's uh, still unclear uh, if hyperuricemia, it has a clear causal effect uh, or it is just a marker of other risk factors like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, etc. So uh, the uh, correlation between hyperuricemia and cardiovascular disease is not well established. This is a study of uh, 112 patients with heart failure being followed for a uh, four year survival rate. And uh, it was found that those who had uric acid more than around 600 or 560, the four year survival rate was uh, 19. It was very low. Uh, compared to those who had uh, less than this level, it was 79%. However, in this study, uh, it did not address uh, the issue with the low cardiac output and the diuretic therapy as they both reduce the uric acid uh, excretion. This is just uh, one of the studies um, uh, with uh, around uh, 110 patients divided in two groups uh, being followed with allopurinol treatment just to see the effect of reducing uric acid over time. And it, <clears throat> it showed that um, there is uh, improvement of the... Two minutes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, with the renal uh, function, uh, significant improvement over time. Even the cardiovascular risk has been dropped using allopurinol, uh, allopurinol over time. Uh, as you see, a uh, significant uh, drop with uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, and this is uh, uh, contradictory to this, uh, the exact uh, heart failure trial that looked at the effect of allopurinol and symptomatic heart failure uh, who had uh, uric acid more than 
9.5, around uh, 600 uh, micromoles per liters. Uh, and they studied 253 patients the, and followed for uh, 24 weeks. And it showed that allopurinol used in such patients with heart failure uh, did not uh, affect, uh, uh, did not have any effect on several markers like survival, uh, the worsening of heart failure, quality of life, ejection fraction, etc. So uh, the conclusion was uric acid is a real marker of worse outcomes. However, if we try to lower it, it didn't do anything regarding the cardiovascular um, uh, events uh, and worsening. And I'll finish by the conclusion. Uh, hyperuricemia is extremely common lab finding that may or may not have clinical relevance. Uh, uric acid level uh, of six milligrams per deciliter or 360 micromole uh, or more, uh, most accepted upper limit of normal, but remains controversial. Vast majority of individuals with asymptomatic hyperuricemia remain silent and have no clinical uh, relevance. Uric acid crystals deposition is the only well-established clinical implication of hyperuricemia. Despite of high uh, associations, uh, hyperuricemia still needs further studies to establish its causal uh, effect in non-crystal deposition. And awareness uh, of the clinical relevance of hyperuricemia is important uh, among physicians given its high prevalence and variable outcomes. Thank you.